everyone knew who he was. People tended to tell their children not to play with those people. John Jr. once called me and uh, called me and my mother at that one o'clock at night, waking us up, asking to borrow money because his wife's car was stuck and he needed to have cash to have a toad. And I, I really don't think it was a true story. It took nine months for him to pay it back. Father walks in one day, puts his hand on my shoulder, he goes, come here, I want to talk to you for a minute, and goes to shake my hand. As I shook his hand, I felt something. And he said, listen, you're doing a good thing for the kids. I want to thank you and just keep working with my son, and I appreciate it. So I don't know, and he walked away, and then I walked into my office over there, and it was $5,000. Almost fell over. John Francis, the son, one of the nicest, sweetest, considerate, and gregarious people ever meet. His drug habit was completely off the charts. This boy was about 22, 23 years old already. And he, you know, he was trapped in that drug world. And he really, really wanted to get out of it. And I think a good part of the motivation was to please his father. I noticed his dad would come down every night. We sat down and listened to him about his son and his concern. And I mean concern to the point when he talked about it, I saw a tear in his eye. And I told the kid over and over. I said, I wish I had a dad like that. Well, when I would shoot cocaine, I would, you know, and how dirty the bathrooms are in New York when the toilets don't work. I'd take the toilet bowl water. I mean, that was nothing to me. I would shoot it and I'd miss. And you'd be, I'd be getting high, just trying. Every time, it would take me five shots to get one shot, one rush. And then a friend of mine who was a uh, retired police officer from New York City came in and Sonny was there the same day and he grabs him by the arm and he goes, hey, you know who that is? I said, yeah, the guy brings his kid down and the guy gave me a lot of money to buy uniforms and equipment for the kids. He goes, that's the most notorious mafia figure probably that ever lived in New York. There was a case many, many years ago that I had. Uh, it was an unsolved murder that I looked into in Brooklyn, but they said it, it, the fellow was a drug dealer and he was uh, giving drugs to John Jr. And he was rolled up in a carpet in a, in a lot in Brooklyn. And I'll just leave it at that. He was never just John. He was Sonny's kid, Sonny's kid, Sonny's kid. When does he get to be him? Sometimes your children don't necessarily follow in, your, in the footsteps the way you would like. And, you know, wearing the wire is the ultimate, you know, act of betrayal. But what about John Jr.? Can't answer that. Leavenworth, when I started walking up the steps, and that thing was so big, and I started crying. He must have been looking out the window because he saw me crying. I don't know how he did it. But when he finally came out into the visiting room, he was looking at me and he saw my head was down and he gave me a gentle smack in the face and he said, hey son, I just want you to know if you're gonna cry, Cry with your head up. You don't ever have to be ashamed for crying. So 
so he gave me another out. But I still felt like I wouldn't make him happy by crying. So I look at the evidence, and then I didn't see the evidence then. You know, he would have never liked any other choices than I made. He would have definitely accepted them. As much as this family had been through, something was going to happen that would be unimaginable. Sonny was 93. For him to go to prison would be a death sentence. At least that's what everyone thought. A lot of what the FBI does is getting people to give you information, okay? That is in the form of informants, confidential sources. And we met one day at Christopher Morley Park. He didn't have to work anything off. He wasn't arrested, indicted. My approach was, John, listen, I, I'll help, I can help you and you help us. And I figured, what is my life worth even if I get killed? I'm dying anyway. And it's better for everyone that your dad isn't targeted because you're going to be able to talk to him and find things out that you can tell me, well, what good is that if he's in jail? That's no good for you and it's no good for us. You wear the wire, all right? We're not going to target your dad. You go around, you get these guys on tape, all right? And I'll see what I can do about getting you into the witness security program. There were many times Rob said, don't worry about your dad. You got to go take him to meetings. We'll get information. I don't mind knowing. He said, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to put your dad in jail. Well, I guess it, it resonated with him, and he decided to become, at that point, a confidential informant. In 2001, I got sober. Right. I started uh, realizing that people's lives mattered and that, you know, things were hard for me so I could relate to other people things being hard to. And I started seeing stuff like what happened to Norby, how I harmed other human beings, and how I didn't like to be hurt. I felt I owed something because of that. It was like looking forward. So how did you meet John? I met John at a structured sober living facility that he entered in 2001. Truthfully, what can I say this? What I remember was like, look at the butt on that guy. What a nice ass. <laughs> he really looked good in this pair of jeans he was wearing. So this it was Odessa House. This, this is, was Odessa House. And this is where you, this is the house that Owned or ran? She ran it. I went to that I retire, I went. Uh, recovery meeting. I went there to run away from Michael. My manager pulled out this humongous bag of medication and handed it to John. And I'm like, what is all that? He goes, well, he, he has HIV. John had left the office and he comes back with this book called Murder Machine, stuffed with newspaper clippings of articles of his father, his brother, people that they knew, you know, forward fast to, we wound up moving in together and then he said, hey, you know, there's this 12-step convention in Vegas next month, Thanksgiving weekend, want to go? And I said, yeah, let's go. He says, let's get married that weekend. And I said, yeah, okay. What was it like wearing the wire around your father? I don't mean to say this, but it, it wasn't very hard to do. I had my resolve about I mean, is that the right word? Resolve. I made up my mind about it. I knew what I was doing. Uh, I knew why I was doing it and all the above. So that wasn't the hard thing. By that time, everything I thought of that life was bad. Everything. I had no, I didn't want no part of that. I said, will you be as fair as you can and keep him out again as long as you can? Maybe for once in my life, I could really go somewhere and nobody know me and see who I really am when I have no outside things to lean on. 
he used to say, you know, I, I, I have to go out of the room to talk to people because it's just better that you don't know things. This life is, it's, it, what, what has it done for you? What, what have these people done for you when you were down and out? All right, did anybody come to help you? Not really. So do you owe them anything? I don't think you do. If anything happens, if like maybe I disappear one day, he handed me a business card, he goes, I need you to call this person. So when he handed me the card, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know? And I also knew that as long as I was in the investigation and the government felt like I was giving them information they needed, they wouldn't put my father in jail. Two weeks later, he calls me. He goes, I'm in. When do we start? I said, we start tomorrow night. Rob had already told me that there was a lot of stuff going on in New York. So when I went there, I was really prepared and knew. I knew what I was there to do and knew what I decided to do. It was the night of September 17th, 2006. He had said, I have to cash a check, so I'm going with Joel. I'm gonna spend the night. I'll be back tomorrow. He got into the car. I said, if you leave, don't ever come back. I remember yelling that. And he said, D, I love you tomorrow. I love you, I'll see you tomorrow. And I think I had tennis shoes in a bag and I tried to toss the bag. And that's the last time I saw him. Tina was trying to call him, Sonny was trying to call him, and I'm trying to call him. Then his voicemail was full. And Johnny totally disappeared. When Sonny found out about John, there was the, the period of denial. Part of that probably because it was his son, but part of that too because it's a very inconvenient truth for him that, uh-oh, you know, how does this paint me now? You know, how does this paint Sonny? The FBI put me to the side and they told me, you can stop looking for Johnny. He's with us. As far as I know, I am still married to John. We are s still married. Maybe 48 hours later, I got a call from his dad. Where, where's that kid of mine? And I said, what do you mean, where's the kid? I don't know. What was it like testifying against him? He looked beaten. Not because of the case, because of me. I knew it wasn't easy for me to testify against my dad, but I knew I wasn't testifying against my dad. It was his way of life. I didn't feel like I owed them an explanation. I feel like they needed to make an explanation for what they did. Make a right, Bobby, sorry. Yeah, I'm get, but I'm gonna make a left. Right? Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. Forgive me, I don't mean to ever be, look, don't worry about my dad me. used to be the worst in a car. <laughs> in terms of direction? Like this, left, right, right, left. And <laughs> you never you never could please him. And I would be smoking and driving at the same time. You're, Jesus, you're touching your socks. You got a cigarette in your hand. You're changing the radio. And he goes, why don't you back up? You missed a few potholes that you would <laughs> And Frankie Camp would be in the car. And, he, and he'd be such a kiss ass. And the minute my dad got out of the car and he goes, I don't know how you do it. He says, I'm so glad you're driving today. People in New York had heard that I was doing really good. And I kept telling them, I don't live that life anymore. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm living in a Section 8 housing. I'm happy. Go to meetings. I meet with other people. I'm speaking in hospitals. I'm speaking about HIV at UCLA. I'm working for being alive. Tina and Goldie were like unbelievable, like inseparable. She would take him to the high school and she begged me to come and I would go every once in a while and I wouldn't go and 
she went to Christopher Morley Park. It was her little space. After she passed away, my mom said, hey, you remember Tina's friends? Oh, actually, she told me about how they went to the funeral, all of them. They had raised money to donate to the dog park. And on top of it, they got a bench with a plaque with my sister's name on it. At that point, I had remembered how much I uh, didn't pay attention to her in her life. Uh, the hell with all of us. She did something really good for some people and, you know, they, re they remember her and they miss her and it was really nice. Sonny ended up on tape because he would inevitably walk into the room while John was wearing a wire and was conversing with other members and associates. And John was instructed, you cannot turn that wire off. So Sonny would come in, barge right into the conversation, offered specific tips, hints on, for example, how to, the right way to shake down the hustler in the penthouse. So inevitably he got caught up on tape, but it wasn't our intention. It's just that he needed to be involved in those conversations. How do you feel about your brother when he wore the wire? That must have been difficult. Yeah, it was, uh... I mean, we even talked about it today. He asked me if I knew where my brother was, my father. I said, because my brother's in trouble. He can't come around. He's hated. You know they want to kill you, right? Well, yeah, they, if they could have, they, of course. I think John has been voiceless. I think people see him, oh, this guy's a junk, he's a this, he's a that. I get that. Because I've, made those, I've casted those same aspersions on many of people. So I'm, I'm sure Sonny was absolutely crushed as both his sons uh, testified. But when you really look at what Michael did, uh, he did very, very little against organized crime. I just think that he just needed money for probably more drugs. I don't know if he still was. I haven't seen him in years. He just turned into somebody that, you know, after a while, nobody, no, nobody really liked. So that's what I chalked that up to. His own son, the bastard John Jr., that bastard son of his drove for three years. Drove him around. Sonny was doing the sit downs in the car, and that kid was wired. And he took the witness stand and told the jurors, as far as he knows, whatever is on the wiretap, whatever my father said is true. Frankie Camp at the ball field said Michael didn't hurt anybody, but John's wiring up obviously led to a number of uh, indictments, arrests, convictions, and he ended up testifying against his own father. We spent more than a year talking to John Jr. And like everything else with this family, it's complicated. It appeared that John Jr. was always seeking his father's approval, and he risked his life to make peace with him. And yet it was his father's life and belief system that ruined their family and the lives of everyone else who got in his way. Guy Fatato was making consensual recordings against then underboss of the Colombo crime family, Sonny Franzese. Sonny was there standing over him and saying, hey buddy, he was calling buddy, buddy, or pal, can I talk to you? And he's like, yeah, what's going on? And he said, uh, uh, you know, about John, you know, I know what's happening here and, and if this is true, I may need you to go out there and take care of them. And according to Audible, making the gun gesture. The government says that your father wanted yeah. to kill you. Okay. Once again, like I told you what happened with Michael. My father would rather die for whatever reason than kill his family. I know he knew that I would never believe it. That's why I had to go see him, to let him know Dad, I never believed that for one minute. You want to know the truth? I wanted him to know that I knew that he loved me, no matter what he said. That was really the one thing I wanted to do for him. Now, whether he spit at me or told me to leave or whatever would have been okay. I don't know how far he would have carried the Sonny Franzese thing if he felt he had to. But I know 
that if I would have said that to him, it would have mattered to him. What I didn't know was how much I needed to hear him say what he said. He was the type of man, no matter what that kid could do to kick dirt in his face, so to speak, you know, he, he just wanted that kid so badly to flourish. He would have been disappointed, but I don't think he would have uttered any curse words or thought about killing his son or having somebody do it. And now you're out of witness yeah. security. Are you worried someone's going to kill you? Well, the thought goes through my mind sometimes. We knew what we could do, what we've done, so we know it could be done to us. When he signed out of protection and, and things, and they said, what happens? What happens if you, well, they track you down, they kill you? And, and he said, if, and here, he said, if four months from now, someone tracks me down and kills me, this would be four months of freedom that I have not had. He was just stuck here. I didn't go see my mother's funeral or my sister Tina's. And I could have, but I didn't want to go into the, either of their funeral with marshals and make it about me. And I think a bunch of people felt that part of me leaving the program would be the opportunity for me to at least have that moment with my dad. That somewhere in my life I'm going to need to remember that I went there. I had indicated to him before, anytime you ever want to talk to any of your family, if you need my help, I'm willing to do that. I was willing to go as a go-between, maybe to his siblings and things of that nature, if he wanted to do that. And, um, and then he mentioned it, he mentioned it again right before we went, he said, I think I want to see my dad. And um, I said, let's go. What's, when are we going? What's the dates? We're booking it. We're going. So two weeks ago was the first time you've seen your father? First time. First time he ever verbally talked to me. I sent messages to him. I wrote letters to my mother for him. She said, look, honestly, your dad says he loves you, but he don't want to read you. I don't want to lie to you, John. He don't want to read. He don't want me to read your letter. My goal was to sit with my dad, you know. And I walked in there, but I didn't recognize him. And I said, uh, hello, and he saw me. And he said, hey, and he took his hat off, but he didn't know it was me either. And he said, hey, what are you doing here? And I says, I'm here, he says, you know who this is? He says, it's coming to me, it's coming to me. Let's go in the other room. Do you know who this is? And he goes, it's coming to me, it's coming to me. He said, how well did you know Anthony? I said, I knew Anthony really well. And uh, I said, do you know who this is? He says, uh, you know, I gotta be honest, I don't. And then I said, Dad. And he looked at me and I said, it's John. And he went like this, John. He goes, what are you doing here? You gotta be careful. They're gonna look to kill you. And he was getting all nervous about all this stuff. Uh, he was looking at me really close when I was talking and he goes, he said, let me ask you, why you got those wrinkles? <laughs> I said, dad, you remember how I used to live? He goes, yeah, he said, too bad you didn't listen to me sooner. <laughs> I said, dad, no matter what anyone says, it's been 17 years since I had a drink or a drug. And he goes, well, I believe, he said, I believe you. I believe you look good. And then he said, you know, uh, it wasn't nice, that letter you wrote to the judge. He would never say I testified. I mean, he wouldn't. I don't think only to me, I think to anybody. Then he goes, why did you do that? The only one who ever asked me why. Did they give you a half a million dollars? And I said, no, Dad. He said, I didn't think so. I made that choice, Dad, and uh, I never meant to hurt you. But I had to do that. And he's like, huh? Well, you're my son. I love you. And then he said, he waited about three or four seconds. He goes, but you've always been crazy. But what about John Jr.? 
can't answer that. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe all the drugs he took screwed his mind up. Maybe the medicine he took brought something out of him that he never knew existed. I don't know, I can't answer that. Listen, it broke my heart. He would be the last guy I thought would do that. But he did it, what can I do? I love my brother. I mean, I practically raised him when my dad was away. So, I mean, I feel horrible about what happened to him. I, I hope to God he straightened out his life and that he has some peace and he goes on and lives good because I would love for him, this may get me in trouble, my father might be mad at me, but I would love for him to be around his nieces and nephews again. I mean, this is a family that they would enjoy him and he would enjoy them. Mostly this stuff was me working through parts of my life that I had to make sense of. What I felt about not seeing my family, my mother, Tina, I really had to get to know me. If ever someone came to kill me, one of the things I hope to happen is me telling him I forgive him. Of course, though, I would hope it would never happen, though. So you want to call me a rat? Fine. So you want to kill me because I'm a rat? I understand that thinking. I got nothing against you. But it's a mistake, and I feel sorry for you for doing that. And that's how I feel. The lowest form of life I thought that was on earth. Changed the definition for me. There's nothing in me that tells me I'm a low life. There's nothing in me that tells me I'm a disgusting animal. Betrayed my father or anything. There's nothing in me that says that. Is there sadness that my father went to jail and that he had to, in his mind, see what his son did in his life to him? Of course there is. But because my dad's who he is, I was able to do what I did. My dad believed in his life. I really never believed in it. I bought into it. I believe in my life. He taught me that. It's true.